Are you curious about the unknown, the unexplainable? Do you find yourself intrigued by the mysterious and paranormal side of our world? Join us on an adventure into the world of inexplicable discoveries and investigations that may someday give us a final answer as to what may be behind the veil of reality. Then it's time to turn your pods up because we're live to tape from the mountains of West Virginia. It's time once again for Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. The universe is waiting for you. <laughs> Everything in this universe has a beginning. The Big Bang. The formation of nebular matter into stars and planets. The first collections of amino acids in the Earth's oceans. The first creatures to leave them. The first mammals. The first primates that walked upright. The first religion. The first printing press. <laughs> Pump up your space boots and phone home. It's time for Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. Unknown. Live to tape from the mountains of West Virginia. It's Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. Bigfoot, UFOs, Stargates, Let's Find Out, Paranormal, Intelligent Design, Entertainment, Let's Find Out. You're listening to Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. Live to tape from the mountains of West Virginia. It's another episode of Let's Find Out with me, co-host Diego. Thank you for taking this journey with me on this episode of Let's Find Out. I met our guest not long ago at the Virginia Bigfoot Con in Wayers Cave, Virginia. He's an author, illustrator, and realm hopper. His book, Winslow Hoffner's Incredible Encounters, features a remarkable story filled with folklore, cryptid creatures, magic, all told by one man that happens to have seen it all. Along with his ongoing World of the Orb and Chicken Boy series that have made him one of the top authors in Northern Virginia, please welcome to Let's Find Out Master Storyteller, Michael Thompson. Michael, my friend, welcome to Let's Find Out. I'm happy to have you on. I'm thrilled to be on. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was awesome. Oh, no, you know, I, I did it in a way because it's funny. When, when I first entered into the hall down in there in Weir's Cave, you're the first one on the right. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately drawn to your booth for several reasons. One, the amazing artwork on your banners. Oh, thank you. R remarkable artwork. And then I saw your setup and then I saw you had an orb next to you. And I was like, I need to talk to this guy. And then you started conversing with me, but you had this fantastic um, introduction to what you were doing. And I was like, man, this guy is on top of it. So of course, you're taking that same energy to your to the way you write your books as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do. I love storytelling in all mediums, whether it be uh, the visual uh, medium of illustration, telling stories with pictures, or it be the written word. And I enjoy filmmaking as well. Um, but yeah, and uh, I think your listeners will very much enjoy the Winslow Hoffner series, which is my cryptozoology, folkloric fantasy on the high seas. Um, and we have a sequel coming out very soon. And that's some of the artwork that you got to see while I was down at the uh, ECBRO Virginia Bigfoot Con. That was the big banner that had uh, the Loch Ness Monster on it. So that's a bit of a sneak peek for the next book in the series where our main characters take it on the Loch Ness Monster. Wow. You know, it, it's amazing because in the world of cryptozoology, it, it's such a huge thing because it encompasses not only cryptozoology and paranormal, but you're adding also story about seafaring and what i noticed that there in folklore in cryptozoology and all that there's so much material there how did you narrow down the specifics to put all this in a seafaring book nonetheless right yeah and uh seafaring it's a it's a great backdrop for it because the the sea is such a mysterious place already it covers such a massive portion of the planet and it's so uh, it's so deep. We don't know we don't know what's down there. So it's a perfect uh, perfect area for uh, mysteries and monsters to spring up on our main character. But I've always been very interested in folklore and uh, researching that. It was kind of one of my hobbies uh, when I was young, just reading books about urban legends and folklore and cryptids. And 
it was way back in high school when the first material of Winslow Hoffner's Incredible Encounters ever sort of started to materialize. And I sometimes I get these like ideas for stories and then I'll you know write it down and I'll put it away. And the first thing that ever came to me for the Winslow Hoffner series was a single line and it came through like just popped into my head with the accent as well of the of the speaker uh, saying, have you ever stared straight into the eyes of death and scoffed? And I was like, ooh, that's pretty good. And so I kind of typed it into a document and I put it away on, on my computer. I didn't, I didn't really know uh, anything more about it, but eventually I had an assignment in one of my classes to write a short story. And I remembered that line instantly. And I was like, I really want to find out uh, what story is waiting to be told from that line. And so I opened it back up and, and remembering the way it sort of came through to me uh, the, the, the dialect of the character speaking, it, it sounded like a seafarer. It had that salty sort of man of the sea type vibe. And, and I thought, okay, well, what are the eyes of death? It couldn't be a regular fish. It couldn't be even a shark. You know, that's not, that's not scary enough. And, uh, my other foundational interest, which was uh, cryptozoology started to percolate again. And I, I remembered stories of, uh, what's called, uh, globsters, these unknown creatures that washed ashore. And, uh, one of them was, Gambo is was the name that was given to this one mystery creature uh, that washed ashore in the Gambia in 1983. They thought it might have been a mosasaur, maybe it was the last of the mosasaurs or like some type of prehistoric relic dolphin. Uh, but before science had a chance to document it, the body was chopped up and buried in the sand. The head was sold to a tourist and it was never seen again. And for me, that was uh, an exciting mystery and an opportunity to almost like historical fiction, go back and imagine what this thing might have been. And there was obviously a, a lot of room uh, to have creative freedom with that. And so one of the things I like to do with my stories is start with uh, the most unbelievable premise possible, but make it believable. Because if I myself as the, as the writer can, can uh, believe it, then I imagine that it would, be, it would become believable for my, for my readers as well. And then everything else from that point on uh, you know, you're locked in. And so I interpreted uh, this creature, Gambo, as a fire-breathing fish. Uh, I knew that magnesium could burn underwater. It gets so hot, it creates its own oxygen. And I thought that could be the way that uh, she breathes underwater. And uh, it sort of took on the shape of like your classic fisherman's tail, but with a real monster. All sounds fantastic because you're talking about, we're going back in high school at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And so what was it that drew you to... Uh, the cryptozoology and that because look I'm, I'm i'm much older guy than you at this point and i remember also in elementary school the best thing that a school has best resource in a school is a library yeah yeah because when everything goes wrong in school you go to a library you could open up a book you could escape into another universe yeah uh, mine was and not to bore you but i don't even know if this book's still in print i don't even remember what it was called i know it was on three subjects it was Loch Ness, UFO, and Bigfoot. Ooh. And that book right there, it took me to places that just now doors are opening for me of, 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 of wonder and information. So at such a young age, what brought you to the dance in, in that field? Oh, yeah. I, I very similar. I, I was very into, um, you know, my, my, my schools had those uh, scholastic book fairs, and I would always pick up the ones that chronicled mythology and had like sort of uh, all these different entrances of um, there was one there was a really good one. It was an illustrated one that had uh, not just mythology, but also the more modern stuff, the cryptozoology. And the exciting thing about cryptozoology is it's mythology that's happening now in 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 the real world it's it's a compilation of stories that can't quite be verified but um it injects this uh wonderful sense of mystery so as a storyteller it's almost like the last frontier of the unknown and it and it opens up so many cool possibilities to uh fill in those spaces with stories and with those stories luckily that you started that assignment with a short story and mm -hmm. how yeah. did you envision i mean because you said the voice came out how did you did you practice that voice or is it something that came automatically because it was it was already born in your mind yeah that was one of the features that just came through uh was the voice and as it turned out because uh with some of my other books like with world of the orb is um the imagery is kind of what came through first and this seems to be sort of um sort of the process where either there's a 
foundational image or there's a foundational line of dialogue. And from there, the story blooms outward. And, and uh, that's sort of where I, where I start to discover it. With Winslow, it's uh, the first thing that came through was a line of dialogue, which is appropriate because the book is so dialogue driven. It's almost entirely dialogue. It's maybe like 70, 70, 30. Um, and so it kind of reads like a script. So there's a lot of personality and a lot of the story that's revealed within the dialogue. I call it like a framed story. So um, even though we kind of, our main character in the first book really is uh, John Chaplin, who's our journalist, who is encountering Winslow Hoffner for the first time. He's new to his paper and uh, he's sent out to uh, listen to uh, this old man talk about this strange encounter he had on the bay. And he thinks it's, it's just a fluff piece. This is something they dumped on the new guy and uh, they're just kind of like, you know, giving him busy work. Um, and he's a very skeptical man. He's a very fact-based man. And so when he starts hearing Winslow's story, as unbelievable as it is, the passion and the certainty with, with which he tells it starts to affect our main character. And that's where a lot of the story uh, story happens there. Well, you know, and it's amazing because not only, and I admire anybody that can take their ideas and research and, and make a fantastic story, especially I think it's a little more difficult when you talk about folklore and cryptids because you really have to do not only the research but you really got to know what you're talking mm -hmm. about but as if doing that is not hard enough you also made an audiobook version of this oh yeah <laughs> and i was listening to the to the sample you had on your website and um the voice man you nailed it thank but you how i'll say how hard it was but how how um how was that process it was a fantastic process that was something um that sort of came together very magically and um, very, it was, it was, it was wonderful how it came together. I had a friend, a uh, sort of a colleague at, over in uh, this old town where I sell a lot of books. I've done festivals and I was at a meeting for another festival that they were planning to put on. And as it turned out, he, he runs this uh, Allegro community school of the arts. His name is Sam Yoder. And um, it's this great, it's this great place. And he's been working in audio and, and uh, sort of sound production for decades. And he had this idea that he wanted to work with independent authors who wanted to record audiobook editions of their own books. And so this was kind of a proof of concept for him. And it lined up perfectly uh, that that's what I was looking to do uh, with uh, Winslow Next. And so it happened at the right time and I came in and he taught me a lot about performance. Uh, I always remember he's like, you know, it's not just about reading it. Clearly it's a, it's about, it's a performance, it's acting. And he told me, you know, remember uh, the, the listener can hear a smile, for instance, they can hear how you hold your face when you're uh, uh, talking into the microphone and they can. So, so when you're, when you're reading it, when you're performing it, you have to imagine you have a whole audience out there because um, I've done readings of the book a lot of times. And uh, this was this was the first time that I ever recorded an audio book. So he was reminding me to, uh, you know, it's, it's as if uh, I have an audience there and so perform to them. And and so with his uh, with his uh, instruction and, and his uh, tutelage, uh, we created just the most amazing brand new way to experience the book. The book is written phonetically, so if anyone uh, reads it on the page, the um, the dialogue is written with the dialect sort of baked in. So uh, so you'll get like you know uh, Winslow will say ta instead of to and and uh, into and gotta and all those things and um, and then in the audiobook edition you get to hear that and so each character has their own unique voice and personality and I really enjoyed uh, bringing each of them to life. Is, was that something you already had in mind for each character or did, did you have to um, do a lot of practice and say, what would they say? What would they not say? How would they say, mm -hmm. you know, how is the emotion into it? How, how did that process go? Because it seems to be, I would say just as difficult as writing because now you have to perform it. And right. Did you draw also from your um, experience with filmmaking as well on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely did. And as far as the preparing the voices go, Wins Winslow was kind of living in my head that way um, already. And a lot of the characters that had more of a, 
if they had they had it, when it's baked into the dialogue like that i kind of knew what they sounded but when they had a subtler when they had a subtler accent that those were ones that, that i had to practice and, and say okay you know how do i how do i make sure that they're distinguishable and i really wanted um you to have a good understanding of, of who's talking uh regardless of of the tag so so as soon as the dialogue starts you know you won't need the said winslow you would you would automatically uh, know who is speaking for instance on the performance base, let me just throw this mm -hmm. question out there because yeah. talking filmmaking in your mind, if there were an actor out there or a performer out there, who would be with a past present, you know, from whatever time, uh, as long as Hollywood has been around, who do you think would be a, the perfect actor that would be a perfect Winslow? That is a, that is a wonderful question. Um, uh, I think that there, there's a great actor. I don't know if you've seen the show um, Z Nation uh there's a show on sci-fi channel or there, or there used to be called uh, z nation and um the person who played doc his name is uh russell hodgkinson and he kind of has the look and he's got he's got the energy and i think that he would make a wonderful winslow so with all the conventions you've gone to because i i've been reading your page you're you're a very busy person you're always moving and that's a great thing and i'm marking your book you got to get out there um, how has is it a, you're an award-winning author how I mean other, you know how has the book been received by the readers oh this book has been received fantastically and I've, I always get so many wonderful uh, messages in uh, like on Instagram people will message me and and uh, sometimes they'll ask me questions um, not just about this book but also world of the orb I'll get wonderful messages about world of the orb asking about uh, the characters and stuff and um, and sharing how, how they enjoyed the story so it's been a very warm reception and uh and it's it's aligned very nicely with um this sudden uh sudden appearance of a lot of brand new cryptozoology and paranormal themed conferences and uh that's sort of been that's sort of been a nice a nice gift and so i've i've been enjoying meeting even more uh people who would really really enjoy the book there and uh, so yeah it's been it's been great and now that the second book is about to come out um it's perfect timing Ah, second book, and I know you don't want to give any spoilers, but let's. Uh, if you could please, for the listeners of Let's Find Out, what is uh, if you could dangle a carrot in front of them, um, what what can we expect? Uh, you can expect this. This book is as much as it is a sequel. It's also a bit of a prequel. Uh, we're going to dive into the past a lot and see how Winslow uh, came to be the man that he is, and perhaps get a little bit of a sense of why monsters are so charmed by him and so drawn to him. Uh, and so there's a bit of a magical, mystical element. And also in terms of the types of uh, tales and types of uh, folklore that uh, your listeners can expect, there's going to be a big emphasis on Celtic uh, mythology. There's going to be, and, and cryptozoology, of course, as you saw, the Loch Ness Monster is going to make a stunning appearance. And then there's also uh, some cool, comp some cool references to Welsh and Irish mythology as well. Wow, you, you mentioned all those because it's such a complex universe. Mm -hmm. Those mythologies. So, other than I, I'm sure reading or research like that, where did you draw that information from? Because it's even with Greek mythology, because it, it, there's so much you can do with that. Um, where did you draw the information, the bullet points on that? Well, I definitely enjoy uh, reading books and uh, doing my fair share of internet deep dives to find all of my um, all of my different mythologies. And then, as far as as far as the storytelling aspect, weaving them all together is a really fun puzzle. Um, how do we create a story that cohesively includes all these different types of cryptids and magical beings as well? And uh, so. I think that a lot of the uh, connective tissue is, is uh, well, a bit of it is a surprise, but it's accomplished uh, through our sort of, there's a men in black type uh, agency uh, within the Winslow Hoffner universe that Winslow has connections to. And that is kind of always sort of like skulking on the, on the perimeter of, of, uh, of, of our, of the world of the book. And um, they help, they help add a little bit of context uh, for the readers and they sort of help weave it all together. 
and uh yeah so it's it's kind of it's kind of neat not only not only do you get to explore all these great mythologies and in, in cryptozoology and legends um but then interpreting them in a way uh that is cohesive for the book is is really really fun talking about books because it's been in my experience that books it's kind of like a it's hot and cold at times mm-hmm. where you go to a good period of time where there's just nothing happening with books all of a sudden, boom, a good series comes out in a second and a third. And these authors, their popularity, their popularity explodes. Mm-hmm. I, embarrassingly enough, I did not know that there's such another resurgence in, in books now. Because since doing this show, I've met so many authors. And I've seen what, what they're doing. It, it's amazing work. It's almost like there's a, a, a resurgence or a... Mm-hmm. Uh, shot in the arm for reading again. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I think a big component of the resurgence is the rise in uh, independent publishing and uh, the, the tools that are available uh, for people to sort of bypass um, the traditional means and, and uh, get their work out on their own terms, on their own timeline. And um, yeah, I think that that's, that's the reason why there's so many stories now and going to events uh like where we met the virginia bigfoot con and other conferences like that is a great way for uh people to encounter all all kinds of cool stories and 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 art uh that they might not have found otherwise and i think it was a national a a natural evolution especially for Mm -hmm. self-published because the same thing happened when it took a little while when youtube came on the scene where People became stars or became have a lot of followings with whatever brand they're pushing, whatever type of entertainment they're pushing, where now a lot of TV watchers are not really watching TV. They're out there watching YouTube. They're on Rumble. Same thing with um, radio stations. People got tired of hearing the same old DJs and morning zoos. Now they listen to other podcasts. So I think we're evolving in a better direction now where we don't have to really deal with the... Um, the major publishing companies or the major Hollywood studios, we can actually watch and listen to people who have these amazing stories to tell and you go straight to them. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely. It's a, it's a more uh, direct uh, sort of relationship between the artist and the appreciator of the art. Yeah. And, and, and you're right. It's a better relationship with the the viewers, the readers, mm-hmm. with the authors or the producers, you know, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it, we're better, we're better people for it in a way, because I know we've been talking a lot about the Winslow, but let's, let's talk about world of the orb and the chicken boy series, man. Sure. It, it looks very entertaining. So which one do you want to start off with? And then let the listeners know when they purchase the books, what they're getting into. Sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll work our way back in time. We'll go uh, one, one step backward to world of the orb. Yes. And this was my, this was my first novel after the chicken boy series. The chicken boy series was my first uh, set of books ever, but world of the orb was my first novel and my first award-winning book. Um, that one came out in 2016, shortly after I graduated college. It was about two best pals on a field trip to the museum of natural history. They sneak away from the group and break the one rule. Just not to go in the artifact room and definitely not to touch the orb. And when they do, they're zapped into another world of monsters, myths, and magic that sets them on a harrowing treasure hunt to find Earth again. See, I'm already hooked. <laughs> <laughs> and this was, uh, this was a story that was sort of based on a lot of different sources of inspiration and something that I've been imagining since elementary school. Um, because I was always like doodling and drawing in the margins of my notebooks, these epic battles and monsters and all kinds of things. And I knew I kind of had the instinct that I wouldn't have the time to write a story about each one of the monsters and societies and heroes that I was creating. But if I could create one cohesive world in which they could all live and then take a couple of rule breaking teens from our world and get them lost in that world, um, one, we could tour through all of the amazing uh, societies and stuff and and uh, cool magic systems and things that I built up over all this time. And two, it's a great opportunity for a great uh, story for uh, the kids to grow and use their wits to um, to get back home. Your first one, you said and it was an award winning book, huh? Yes, yes. The Feather Quill Book Awards and it got, it got an award in their sci fi fantasy uh, category uh, for that. And I think it's an international um, a level contest. I don't. I don't know if it's only independent books. I think it's. Uh, it's either. It's either independent or traditional. Sort of pits everyone. 
against each other on a level field. So how surprised were you when, when you heard about this? I the was first time. Yeah, I was thrilled. I think I was like in, in a grocery store at the time that I always go to. And uh, I was like getting a sample and then I got the, I got a buzz on my phone from uh, my, um, from my email and I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> so, and so I, I, I shared my excitement with the, the person that was, you know, giving me a sample of cheese or something. <laughs> and, and, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was truly, truly, truly spectacular. And it was really nice. And, um, or got a lot of nice, uh, attention on, uh, from different reviewers and, and from the, uh, award people. So that was a, a wonderful surprise. And, and I was just absolutely thrilled that there were other people that were enjoying uh, the story as much as I do. Awesome. There's, there's nothing more satisfying than being recognized for the hard work you put into a project, mm -hmm. which yeah, brings exactly. me to the first part. The Because <laughs> I just love the name of this thing. Uh, yeah. Chicken Boy. Let's talk chicken about boy. that. Yeah. Yeah. The Wing Defender. Uh, he was an ordinary chicken until he ate radioactive bird seed. And now he and his buds save the world from monsters and mad scientists in a town where nothing's ever quite normal. Each, uh, each adventure is its own sort of contained thing, but there's also a through storyline. And it's as fun to read as a comic book, but it's got the story of a chapter book. So it's great for like sort of middle grade uh, readers, 9 to 12. And I do all the illustrations in there as well. It's a, it's a completely different art style. It's all cartoons. Um, but that's something that I've, I've been doing since elementary school i created chicken boy when i was nine years old in my fourth Amazing. grade fourth grade class and my teacher mr a he was a big inspiration to me he's kind of the reason that i uh stuck with it and uh, as a thank you to him he gets a cameo in every book he actually there's a picture of him uh hidden on like posters and billboards in the background he's the only photograph in a world full of cartoons um he's the spokesperson for this uh fake uh, uh company <laughs> it's like uh fresh breath mouthwash companies like the pitch man and so he's always on these billboards and stuff uh, advertising that product so it's very funny he was able to really freak out a bookseller uh back in the day when chicken boy was new uh back at borders booksellers uh they were stocking the shelves and they were putting chicken boy up and he pointed at pointed to the book he says you know i'm in that book and the guy's like oh yeah right and so he grabs it and he quickly flips to page 17, I think it was, and he, and he shows him. And the guy's like, <laughs> he's like, what? Who are you? You know, so it was really funny. So you got there, you're traveling, doing all the conventions. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to be next? Because I was on your website and uh, I was looking around. That website is yes. michaelthompsonbooks.com. Very nice looking website. So Thank you. Under appearances, I'm, I'm scrolling yes. and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling. Where are you going to be? 2023. Uh, yeah. We're it's halfway. Right. We're halfway done. Where are we going to be? It's on the. It'll be on the news section. On the news section of uh, the website, I'll be on um, the next one. Will be the Fairfax Comic Con here in Fairfax, Virginia. So, uh, your if you're, any of your listeners are are nearby and want to come by and enjoy a cool Comic Con atmosphere and engage in all things geeky and pop culture, and you can find me uh, selling my books at one of the tables there. That will be, I think I want to say it's the 26th, but let me use my own website. That's my favorite tool. Uh, 26th and 27th of August, Fairfax Comic Con 2023. Well, I think they had one in um, not long ago at the Dulles Expo Center. Yeah, Big Lick Comic Con. I was at that one as well. That was a good one. I just miss you. I go up and down 28 all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's so me. I, I was well, there. I, but I found you a hundred miles away, which is fine. That's, that's <laughs> what just fate. Yeah. What are the yeah. odds? So <laughs> for, for the listeners of let's find out, we go to michaelthompsonbooks.com. Where else can they find out more about your amazing work? Yeah. Uh, michaelthompsonbooks.com is a great place where you can see all the new updates. Um, I'm very active on Instagram as well at M Thompson underscore books. And you can find all the rest of the links, all the links to the books and my other social media on michaelthompsonbooks.com find out where I'm going to be next and uh, maybe we can meet up and I'll give you an autographed copy of, uh, of the Winslow Hoffner series or whatever uh, book you are looking for. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to definitely try to make one of those because I need, I need the book to go along with my bookmarks. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are limited edition bookmarks. I'll probably have the next uh, set of bookmarks because the book two is coming out pretty soon. At least one of the bookmarks will have Nessie on it. And then, um, debating what's going to go on the second bookmark but i think i have a good idea so oh, each book's going to get two exclusive um limited edition bookmarks 
Well, don't give it away because when I come and see you, I'm gonna be surprised, and I'm gonna start collecting these now. Yeah, these yeah, they're gonna be, be very collectible. Yeah, a hundred percent. I believe in you, and I believe in your books, man. Well, thank you for coming on. Let's find out with co-host Diego. And um, one more thing, in the book world right now, if you were to recommend another author, who would it be? Who's the, who's the one out there right now that that's really catching people's attention? Other than you, of course. Other than me, of course. Yes. I would definitely. Uh, uh, you you met uh, you met Brian Nowak at I did uh, at the show. He's great. He's putting out lots of cool horror things. So if any of your listeners are are interested in horror, um, he's kind of at the top of my mind right now, especially because I'm reading his latest book, The App, which is a modern vampire retelling that sort of uh, connects uh, the social media world to vampires. And I, th- I think it's pretty good. I just started it, um, so. I recommend that. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I also enjoyed. Uh, I've only read one of one of the books of this other author. This is another. This is a traditionally published author. Although I think he might do some some indie stuff as well. But uh, Warren Fay has a pretty good book called Fragment, which is a sci-fi uh, book. It's kind of if you imagine Jurassic Park, but with um, crustaceans. <laughs> oh, right. Imagine it like that. Like everything, it's like a sort of a pre-Cambrian island that was allowed to develop uh, on its own and uh, separate from the rest of uh, Pangaea. And so that, that was, it was a cool concept, and he had neat creatures in it. And I really appreciated uh, reading that and um, recognizing a lot of uh, seafaring terms and uh, types of boats that I had already um, that I just learned about for other books that I was writing. And I was like, oh, I recognize that. I recognize that. That's cool. Because um, there's a seafaring element to it as well and a reality television element uh, to it uh, also. And so he he balances all of those things really nicely. So that's that's a cool one for I think your listeners will enjoy because of the creatures. Awesome. We thank you for the recommendation. Sure. Michael, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And if you don't mind, after you release the next book, if you don't mind, come come on back later this year and let's talk about that. Come back on, let's find out with co-host Diego. We'll catch up. I would absolutely love to. Thank you so much for having me on, Diego. Thank you so much. This has been another excellent episode of Let's Find Out with me, co-host Diego. Please check us out on all our social media pages, YouTube, and now we're also on Rumble. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Until next time, my friends. Have you always been curious about the unknown? The unexplainable, do you find yourself intrigued by the mysterious and paranormal side of our world? Then let's find out with co-host Diego is the podcast for you. Join in on an adventure into the world of the inexplicable and get insights from experienced researchers, investigators, and experts. Listen to mind-bending discussions and fascinating stories as Let's Find Out explores the strange, mysterious, and paranormal. Let's find out with co-host Diego is a unique and engaging podcast that uncovers the mysteries of the cryptic and unknown. With insightful interviews and discussions, they discover the very latest theories, discoveries, and investigations that may someday give us the final answer as to what may be behind the veil of reality. Available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Radio Public, TuneIn, and Rumble. Thank you for listening to Let's Find Out with co-host Diego. We're on Spotify, Google Podcasts, TuneIn, Pocket Casts, and on Anchor. For more information about Let's Find Out with co-host Diego, please visit us on facebook.com forward slash co-host Diego, on Twitter at co-host underscore Diego, and on Instagram as co-host Diego. Copyright co-host Diego. All content for Let's Find Out is the property of co-host Diego and is served directly from our servers with no modification, redirects, or rehosting. All celebrity impersonators are paid performers. The impersonated celebrities do not endorse or promote any views or opinions expressed by our guests, co-host Diego, or Let's Find Out. The information shared on Let's Find Out is provided on an as-is basis with no guarantees of completeness, accuracy, usefulness, or timeliness. 